Well, good morning. Welcome to Wake Up in the Word. Listening to Dragon Slayer this morning makes me think about what today is in uh, the entire country, but especially around the South. Mm. I'm recording this on a Saturday that's known as College Football Rivalry Week. And uh, uh, during this time, those great rivalries come together. Many of those have uh, serious implications about bowl games and the like. Uh, the Ohio State Buckeyes and the Michigan Wolverines, the, uh, some of the games already played like Virginia, Virginia Tech, uh, Clemson, Carolina here in the Carolinas is always a big game. And of course, I'm from Georgia, so my big rivalry game is Georgia versus Georgia Tech. Now, in this particular year, I don't hold out a lot of hope that we might possibly win that game. We've had a sad season as the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, but... Um, you never know in rivalry games. I think the only difference is going to be not whether we lose or not, but by how much. But uh, when we get to rivalry games, there's some spiritual lessons involved as well. Some of you may have seen the Ole Miss-Mississippi State game, that great game called the Egg Bowl at the end of this season for those two SEC teams in the state of Mississippi, and how near the end of the game, Ole Miss scores a touchdown, has a chance to tie or go ahead and perhaps win the game, yet one of their players, and this is with only a few seconds left in the game, puts on a vulgar display in the end zone after that touchdown. The referee does what he's supposed to at a time like that, calls an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty on the player. It backs the ball up 15 yards. Ole Miss misses the point after attempt and loses the game 21-20 to Mississippi State. Now, I'm sure that player really feels bad this morning. He really feels like a jerk. And you know, what happens when you mess up? Well, perhaps in the locker room and later after being railed out by the coach and having players perhaps be disgusted with him, it's quite quite possible that he found forgiveness. That he said, guys, I messed up. I am so sorry. Will you forgive me? I, I should have never done that. Uh, you know, look what I've done to our season. And I, will you forgive me? And there's a good chance that folks would say, yes, we forgive you. And there's only one problem with that. Forgiveness does not remove the consequences of sin. Because they lost that game, Ole Miss will play in a lower bowl game than they would have played in had they won that game. Uh, they will not bring home as much money as they would have had they played in the bigger game. Uh, their pr whole prestige, the feeling of we could have beaten our rival is now gone. Now we lost to our rival this year. That's a big deal uh, for college football. So, you know, here's the lesson to learn. Yes, you can be forgiven. And when being tempted to sin and you're thinking in your own mind, well, you know, I can always get forgiveness. Oh, yes, you can. But you cannot change the consequences. And, you know, that's about where we are in Psalm 55 today. This is a psalm of David that's about a distressful time in his life uh, when Absalom was trying to rip the kingdom from him. And it's a terrible time in the life of David uh, when there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of agony in his life, and we're going to read that psalm and see that in just a minute. But the point is, much of that was brought about by David's sin. It goes back to the Bathsheba incident. Now, he came back to the Lord in brokenness when Nathan the prophet called him out and he confessed his sin before the Lord. He sought and found forgiveness from the Lord who restored unto him the joy of his salvation. But the consequences of that sin rippled through his family for a generation. And that's part of what he's having to deal with here. So friends, listen, when tempted, understand, yes, you can receive forgiveness, but guess what? the consequences quite often will still follow you and ripple into the lives of others. So don't sin in the first place. Find the strength to resist and not fall into the sins and the evils and the wickedness that eventually will, because you reap what you sow, eventually will bear some very ugly, terrible fruit in your life down the road. Now, 
That brings us to Psalm 55, which I want to title today, When Tempted to Surrender. David was fighting for his life against Absalom, and that's the background of this particular psalm. And as he cries out in desperation, listen to his cry this morning. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear and answer me. My thoughts trouble me as I am distraught at the voice of the enemy, at the stares of the wicked, for they bring down suffering upon me and revile me in their anger. So when you feel as David felt in these two verses, first, uh, you might feel a bit abandoned by God. Now, you may feel that way, but he has not abandoned you. Okay, but this is how you feel. So you feel abandoned by God, and then you feel abused by people. And if you're there today, what does that bring into your life? Now, it it comes in different degrees depending on the severity of it, but it usually brings us fear, fear of the consequences, fear of reproach, fear of something that's going to possibly happen. And when you fear, here's how you may feel. Now, David's cry is much more distressful, perhaps, than yours today because he was fighting for his very life. Verse 4, My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, Oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter far from the tempest and the storm. Have you been tempted not just to surrender, but to run? Okay, if I could just get away from this. Have you ever wanted to just shut it down and disappear? Have you ever wanted to just, you know, get off the grid, get off the map, just sell it all, disappear, become a hermit in the woods somewhere, just get away from it, and especially get away from the people that are causing you distress. That's the way David felt. Verse 9, here is when David then begins to make his request to the Lord. Have you noticed when we pray, quite often we suggest to God how he should answer our prayers. Now, yes, it's good. Cast your cares upon the Lord. But notice, and and some of us feel guilty about this. Oh, can I say this to the Lord? Well, here's what David was doing. He was just letting his feelings be known. And he was giving God some suggestions on how to answer the prayer. (laughs) So you can see right through that in a minute. But look what he says in verse 9. Confuse the wicked, O Lord. Confound their speech. For I see violence and strife in the city. He was seeing the result of all this yakking that was going on. What it was causing. And so he says in verse 10, Day and night they prowl about on its walls, the walls of the city. Malice and abuse are within it. Destructive forces are at work in the city. Threats and lies never leave the streets. If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were raising himself against me, I could hide from him. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship as we walked with the throng at the house of God. So let the death let death take my enemies by surprise and let them go down alive to the grave for evil finds lodging among them. Now at this point he's really pouring out his heart to the Lord because not only is the enemy working against him and all the gossip that's going around, all the talk that's going around is injuring him, but the very people that are instigating much of this are people who would have called him friend, people who were close companions, people that stood by his side at one time and now are stabbing him in the back. The treachery seems to have hurt David more than anything. And having worked with ministry and ministers through the years, I find that that treachery is, uh, is something that even is found sometimes in the church. And when feelings can be hurt and damaged so badly that uh, I've run into people who uh, are out of church or out of fellowship with a church and, and don't really have a relationship with a local church body. And I'll say, why? What, what happened? And they'll go back to a time in which within a congregation people were acting just like this psalm talks about. How folks who once worshipped together in joy in the house of God now seem to be enemies and are talking about each other and sometimes destroying the sweet fellowship that should make up the family of God in a local church. So then David, having laid out his situation, 
having called on the Lord and poured out his heart, Lord, this is what's going on, and I, would you just kill these people or let me run away or something? And he's giving God all these options. And finally he steps back and says, okay, here's who you are. Here's who you are. Verse 16, but I call to God, and that's the Hebrew Elohim, I call to the ultimate, the God of the universe, and the Lord saves me, and that's the word Yahweh. So I'm calling on you, God, your name is Yahweh. I call upon you and I know you save me. That's a beautiful principle of Scripture pulled right from the Old Testament all the way through the Word of God into the New. The Lord listens. It reminds me of Romans chapter 10 that says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will, will be saved. Okay, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord. And so here we are. Seeing David acknowledge this in the Old Testament, I call to God. Here's who he is. He is the Yahweh, the Lord who saves me. Verse 17, evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. He ransoms me unharmed from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. God, who is enthroned forever, will hear them and afflict them, men who never change their ways and have no fear of God. Now, he begins a summary at the end. Now that I've poured my heart out to the, to the Lord, what, what does this mean for me? Well, first of all, look at what my enemy's doing. Then look at what I am doing. And then look at what God is doing. What's my enemy doing? Verse 20, well, my companion attacks his friends, violates his covenant. His, his speech is smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words are more soothing than oil, yet they are drawn swords. But verse 22 says, cast your cares on the Lord. Cast your cares upon Yahweh. He'll take care of every one of these situations. And He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. But you, O God, will bring down the wicked into the pits of corruption. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men will not live out half their days. But as for me, I trust in you. Listen, friend, today I don't know what your situation is like, but I can tell you the best thing to do is get to the very last part of verse 23, the last part of this psalm. Lay out your case before the Lord. Just tell Him how you feel. Tell Him what you're going through. But in the end, say, But as for me, Lord, I'm going to trust in you today. I'm going to make it another day because you in charge of me is a whole lot better than me trying to figure it out on my own. Trust in the Lord today. He'll see you through. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining me today. Let's do this again tomorrow as we wake up in the Word.